the only words. word they can yeah. use. Yeah. We are, we are, we are, we are we're stimulated and, yeah. and scintillated with the fact we have the uh, the, the, the the founder of uh, the Sustainable Food Trust, Patrick Holden, is with us this evening. Uh, Patrick, um, are you there? Come to He's us. Coming yeah. in there he is. There he is. Hey. Great stuff. See, it works. Wonderful. <laughs> Technology, finally. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely great. We've introduced ourselves very, very briefly to you. Our, our many lovely uh, uh, followers uh, know who we are. Can you give us a, a brief introduction to who you are so that, so that we can place you uh, in the constellation of, of science, of agriculture, of uh, contemporary um, food? Okay, well, I'm part of the constellation of humanity, um, mm -hmm. and uh, I grew up in London uh, in the 50s, well, in and around London, 50s and 60s. My dad was a doctor, actually a psychoanalyst, a child psychiatrist, uh, He, we, because when he was training as a doctor, moved around a lot, and for some reason, which I think it might be connected with epigenetic inheritance from my grandfather, I, I kept I became very interested in keeping animals as pets. So I had an absolute menagerie when I was young. I mean, I had various childhood holidays in wild places in the Hebridean Islands and on farms. But basically at home, which was Peckham in London and then North London, Barnet, I, I built ponds and watched frogs and newts and had a minor bird and a bread rabbits and mice, budgies, you know, I was just really always interested in animals. And I was going to study uh, ethology at university because I read Conrad Lorenz and all those kind of animal behavior books. But then I kind of turned on, tuned in and dropped out as one did in the late 60s and completely flunked out on the university. I went to the University of Life and my dad was then posted out to Palo Alto in the San Francisco Bay Area. He was a visiting professor at Stanford. And I went out and joined the family. And that was even more ex extraordinary experience at that time being in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I came back determined to sort of get back to the land and set up a, you know, a community farm. Uh, so gathered a few friends around who were interested in that kind of thing and read the Communes magazine, which was very sort of prevalent at that time. And that's what we did. We bought a farm, got back to the land, bought a dairy herd and Actually, I did prepare a bit. I studied biodynamic agriculture at a college in Sussex, and I worked oh, wow. on quite an intensive dairy farm for a year. But basically, I learned by doing. And right from the start, because I drank the Kool-Aid, I sort of thought that you should farm in harmony with nature. And I was interested in... I think it just dawned on me that health was not the absence of disease. It was something much more mysterious and positive than that. And I think that we have, you know, a national health service, which will be much better named a national disease treatment service. And I became interested in the idea of positive health. And so I guess that's the reason why you probably asked me to have this conversation with you. Absolutely. So, I, I've nice done others. You know, I, I worked in the Soil Association for 20, 20, 25 years, and then I left that, set up the Sustainable Food Trust. And meanwhile, I've been, you know, doing my, that's my, been my day job, but I have been carrying on on the farm. So milking cows, basically, and looking after all the animals on our farm. We have a, a dairy herd of about 80 Ayrshire cows. We turn nearly all the milk into cheese on the farm. Uh, raw milk cheese, when we're not closed down with TB, that's a discussion. Lots of discussions. Mm. Cool. Connor, what this is, is your this, you're very interested here. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, like I just you spent 15 years in the UK Soil Association. I consider that's such a big part of life and your 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 kind of stuff after that. What what does the UK Soil Association do with itself? What did it do before you joined and how did you leave it? What was it doing? Well, that's a great question because 
Um, I have to go back into history about a hundred years to answer that question properly. <laughs> At the beginning of the 20th century, a man called Sir Albert Howard, who was a pl an expert in plant diseases, knighted for his services to agricultural research, was sent out by the British government to India, actually now Pakistan, northwest India, to the Hunza Valley, to teach the peasant farmers how to adopt Western methods of agriculture. And he had the enormous humility when he arrived there to realize that he, they knew more than he did about truly sustainable farming. And his observations were based on seeing that the, the soil, the way they looked after the soil, seemed to produce very healthy plants. He, they were sort of farming organically, although they wouldn't have called it that. And they were composting all their wastes. And he noticed that the plants, although all the diseases were there, the plants didn't seem to suffer from them. And then the animals, which of course, ate the plants they were very healthy and they didn't seem to get diseases and finally the hunza people were specimens of health and vitality lived to a hundred years were feared fighters and all the rest of it and he concluded that there was a vital link between the health of the soil and the health of the plants animals and people and he spent 35 years in india wrote a book called an agricultural testament when he got back which is his homage to what he'd learned from these peasant farmers that he called his professors and Lady Eve Balfour, niece of Prime Minister Balfour, who was involved with her sister in a farming operation in Suffolk, read the book and was so inspired that she thought it would be important to set up an organisation to promote this idea that health is not the absence of disease, it's a positive state. That was the Soil Association founding meeting 1946, four years before I was born. Ah, cool. And the Soil Association went through a sort of development phase with all these lords and ladies and aristocrats involved. But then a bunch of hippies like me came along in the um, early 70s and kind of challenged the orthodoxy. Not that we disagreed with the views of the founders. We, we violently agreed with them. But we thought this has got to go mainstream because we wanted to farm and sell our products in the marketplace. And there was a pr quite a difficult period there then because we sort of took on the aging council of the soil associations that then was and by this time lady buff was in her 80s and i think she was confused by what the hell was going on but anyway long story cut short uh, we kind of took over the management of the soil association this is by the 80s by this time and uh, i was i was there for 20 years and i think that all our inspiration derived from lady eve herself and those people in the early 20th century who understood these links like there's another man called Do Robert McCarrison who set up the McCarrison Society which is a society for medics who are interested in this stuff and basically they were right and then meanwhile agriculture was industrialized and now we have what Howard described as a as, as a nation of impaired physical and mental health as a result of two generations maybe even three of eating poor food from industrial agriculture yeah so that yeah, then yeah. when I came along yeah. to the Soil Association, we thought, well, mm. we've got to build a market for organic food because we thought, call it something, call it organic. And we realized that if you farmed in an organic way, you probably make less money than if you farmed in a conventional chemical way. So we thought, OK, we better write down what we're doing on the back of an envelope, as it virtually was then. And they became the drafts of the organic standards. And I can claim immodestly to have written the world's first draft of the organic dairy standards because we happen to be first in the field in the soil association so i spent 25 years developing the organic market but now with climate change and everything we can see that it's much bigger change that's needed than just an organic niche market the whole of agriculture has got to change so that mm. that's kind of partly the reason why i set up the sustainable food trust because i could see we needed to work on a broader canvas yeah yeah. What is what is the most important thing? Do you think, Patrick? Very simplistically speaking, you know there are there are you, you can probably about think health about farming dozen. for health uh, to save the planet to stop us eroding our soil and disappearing as a as a society. What, what's we the have most important thing that we can do, and what's the most important thing that the globe should do? Perhaps. Well, people need to realise that you know notwithstanding David Attenborough, who I have met and admire enormously, it's not any longer about saving the rainforest and reinstating the lost biodiversity. Most of the planet is farmed 
and it's been farmed in a really intensive way. So the planet now is sick because the lungs and the digestive system of the planet is its farms. The farms are sick, so the planet is sick. So we have to restore the planet to health by changing the way we farm at scale. All farmers have to do this. So we, because we are citizens who eat, need to eat in a different way, including our dogs. We have to eat the food from regenerative and sustainable and organic farming systems. Because if we all do that, the world will, will you know, that helps the farmers go on the journey. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the, we can see we have got organic brands of, of raw dog food, we call it fresh dog food, and they use organic meats, organic vegetables, a couple of, of, of decent companies doing it, but they struggle to find, uh, like they, they produce tons per day, so they, they struggle to get the amount they need. But isn't that a good thing? Because they didn't struggle too hard 10 years ago, but now the demand for their products is so high. One in five uh, British pet owners is now feeding real food to their pets, and they're struggling. So, that, but that's a good thing because it means there's going to be an organic farmer going. What you? This guy can't produce enough uh, organic chickens. Maybe I can get in on that business. So suddenly it fuels. We're kind of hoping that we use the bits that the humans don't eat in raw dog food. Yeah. So you know, yeah, it, the tripe of the belly of the cow is, is a is a piece that we're happy to use, and uh, beef heart, and until you know. Um, um, Jamie does a kind of a chef show on how to use organ meats. We're, we use those pieces. So we increase the hey, value. Hey, I've got to tell you this. I've got to interrupt and say we did a home kill the other day and we had visit from Neil's Yard Dairy who buy all our cheese or a lot of our cheese. Mm. And because we had the home kill, we thought serve them heart. Yeah. So it was a, a male animal about a year old and we, we slow cooked the heart. It was a recipe from Darina Allen of Ballymaroo Cookery School. It was mm -hmm. absolutely delicious. Yes, no Tremendous. Way. No way, I've never had it. So I'm not, I'm not saying the dogs shouldn't have it. We yeah. can have it too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but isn't it a good thing that this, this hopefully this sector that is growing so, so quickly is creating more money uh, from the spurious bits of the cow. So suddenly the organic meat doesn't have to be this price. It might be slightly cheaper because I'm making more for my heart and tripe and, and bits and pieces that's the dream uh and but it's it, the humans have to sign on to it as well and, and not look at food as expensive but an investment you can put cheap food mm. into yourself as a, as a poisonous or you can spend slightly more in your apples and look at it as something healthy and good for you and, and it's a great you, idea but the problem of course we have is that we we live in such a regulated world where you know doing a home kill of an animal is barely legal yeah. and all the small slaughterhouses that used to exist all over the country to take the animals locally and slaughter them, have all gone out of business. Not all, but a lot of them have. And they're replaced by these enormous abattoirs mm. that you couldn't possibly buy the offal from, even if you wanted to. But we need to change that. And we will change that, as we must. And it's interesting, I, I just come off a conference call with Nestle and a load of other people who are talking about true cost accounting and agriculture. The mm. senior, whatever he's called, vice president of Nestle was on the call because they know all this stuff now as well. And I met the guy who's running the pet food company. This is a few years ago now called Purina. And Purina are enormous pet food company. And the guy who's running it in North America, he was a really interesting guy. And he said, well, we take exactly what you just said, the drop, he called it. They call it in America, the stuff that we don't eat. And they turn it into pet food. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, they're obviously making it into a global business. But what we need is the farming system so that the products that go into the drop are regeneratively farmed, not intensively mm. farmed. And then our pets will be healthier too. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so could I ask, uh, what what did you really find challenging? Because you set up the community farm, you know, back in uh, the 70s and, and you were sort of driving that. And then there must have been some real challenges at that point. You, you buy a dairy herd. You're not really buying a biodiverse type of farming. So, uh, you know, what were your real challenges at that point? And how have you well, overcome those? Well, we went up to... I, somebody said you should keep Ayrshire's, not black and white Frisian cattle. Uh, and it wasn't very sort of, you know, it was just a chance meeting I had with a guy and he said, well, they, you know, they convert grass into milk. Well, they're a bit smaller. They're good, good on eating clover and grass and turning it into milk. And also they've got good milk for cheese making because the protein and fat ratio is good. So I went up to Scotland, as you do, 
or I did, and I found some animals. We bought 22 cows and they came down in a lorry from Scotland. One of them actually carved in the lorry on the way down. <laughs> and she was called Aunt Nora, uh, so, uh, uh, after my aunt. And also she was A. So we had, you know, we had all the cows were named uh, letters of the alphabet. And of course, needless to say, Aunt Nora got mastitis. And we didn't know what to do. So we called the vet in. And the vet said, oh, treat the quarter with antibiotics. So we duly did. And we kind of learned by, you know, we just learned through practice, to be honest. And I think um, that was a very good way to learn. But obviously, you know, it took its toll at times. And we had a really poor, rundown farm. And also we had a very bad drive. And the vet who lived in Lampeter, he would he refused to drive up our firm drive because it was too steep so we had to go down with a tractor and trailer and an old morris minor seat tied onto the trailer and drive him up the drive <laughs> it was very funny no <laughs> And we've had a lot of vets in our time, and one of them was honest enough to say, do you know, I think half the animals they've ever treated would have got back, got better anyway if I'd done nothing yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think that. that it's a very interesting situation with vets at the moment because so many veterinary practices have been fueled by drug sales, and farmers are getting so little for their animals these days that it's hard to justify paying a vet, and that's wrong. You know, we, we need to a culture of veterinary practice where, we respect the knowledge that vets have and it's a partnership and we it's that's been very difficult i think because of what's all the changes that have happened in agriculture yeah that's interesting uh, yeah but what we is we find... mm, Go on. Bren, after you after you yeah i was just going to say so you know you talked then earlier about you know uh, not um disposing of the drop you know the the all of the the waste because we've now got regulations because of the huge abattoirs and how things were with how we were feeding cattle intensively uh, and everything do you see there being any change in that legislation with you know taking away the way we're feeding our cattle and making it more appropriate you know more biologically appropriate feeding uh to our farm animals so that there's less likelihood of these prion diseases etc or do you feel that actually no we're stuck in this rut now and you know that's not going to be a way forward well i definitely think we're stuck in a rut and it's difficult to see a way forward but i think we have to change it i don't think there's any alternative how we change it and how disruptive that will be is an open question but um, I've just been invited by Susan Jebb, who's the newly appointed chair of the Food Standards Agency, to have a meeting with her. Her request, not mine. And so I'm just going to, I mean, I think it's a week or so's time, which is really, really interesting. And, you know, she, she like all the people in the regulatory world, it's a world of fear of bacteria, isn't it? Mm. You know, it's incredible. I mean, as a nation, we have a paranoia about bacteria. And as a friend of mine, Richard Young, who also works in the Sustainable Food Trust, you know, we have a fear, he said, we have a fear of bacteria, but it's bacteria that are going to have the last laugh, which I think mm. is rather great, actually. Yeah. And all these environmental health officers, I mean, they, they, they scare the dairy farming community, especially if you're a cheesemaker. I mean, it's very interesting. If you milk cows, you're in a parlour, and you know the udder and the anus of a cow are quite close together and it's a world of poo really you know and it's <laughs> lovely because it smells delicious of grass and stuff and you know it's just how things are if you milk cows and then we make cheese you go into the cheese making room oh my god you put a hairnet on you have to alcohol your hands yeah, you know yeah, you have yeah. to pass the procedures and people are really paranoid if you said possibly put your hand in the cheese vat god forbid you, yeah. you know you come out of the milking parlor and you're just milking yeah. cows and then you make yeah. cheese, we make a cheddar and you put them in the cheese store and guess what the cheese store is a culture of molds yeah so yes this, this yeah. it's really weird so we make a cheese which is, is encouraging bacterial fermentation yeah but in the cheese room we have to sterilize the shit out of it. Yeah. I have I have an image of him, I have an image of you like, coming into the cheese room, uh, covered in poo and taking your glasses off and just having white eyes for you over here. You put on your white gown and hat and make the cheese all for you. Yeah. Um I mean it really got it's gone deep, is yeah. my point. Yeah. We, we so we have a societal fear of germs. 
the supermarkets and all the food companies have to practice due diligence, otherwise they'll get prosecuted. The Food Standards mm. Agency, which I thought was a mistake when it was created, uh, is reinforcing all this legislation. Fear of regulation, you know, and over-regulation is the blight of public health. Is, That's, is it's that as big as that. We're in a very dark situation. And I think the antidote to it is to deindustrialize farming, relocalize it where possible. I mean, obviously, you have to have some big systems because people live in cities these days. We have to completely change things. And yeah. it's very interesting to speculate what the route map will be. I mean, we have pandemics now. We're a nation with, you know, so few children grow up on livestock farms these days. But I've got four boys only one of whom has ever had an antibiotic treatment. And that was only because he was at school and he had a burn or something. And children who grow up on livestock farms, it's well known, don't get mm. sick. They don't get so many food allergies. You know, they don't suffer from the diseases of the immune system. It's all because we, we are, you know, we depend on the bacterial for our microbiome. Yeah. And it's just gone right out of the whole ethos of society. We have to get it back again. Obviously, there's a a complicated route map to do that but i think it's no choice really yeah, yeah. there's a mm. there's a wonderful uh, raw dog food company over in the states called answers pet food and they the the concept behind it is that uh, they use probiotics in their meat mix a probiotic mix to for the good bacteria to outcompete the bad and keep their meat clean in a industry where the meat isn't always the cleanest over in the u.s but they've got the idea from the amish farming community uh some guys yes. were standing there one day when the amish was making he cleans down his cheese room or, and uh he gets the whey wash and after wiping down all the machines he starts spraying milk everywhere or the equivalent of it whey and uh and the, the guy standing beside goes, what are you doing? You're just cleaning your machines. And you're covering them in milk. And he goes, well, that's way wash. And that's, uh, that cleans them. And within, within five years, they had this industry of using probiotics in skyscrapers, in the ventilation systems to keep the air clean, to keep the people hysteria. Two hospitals in the UK did a big study uh, that washing down with a probiotic wash, it took a couple of days to really for it to work, but it outcompeted for the four of the six top hospital bugs that lay you out. Uh, it outcompeted uh, regular chemicals. So this whey wash idea took off and the guy from Answers Pet Food goes, I could probably clean meat with this. So his meat gets cleaner the longer you leave it out at room temperature. I mean, wrap your head around that. So many possibilities. Brilliant. We, we just see the fear and never the possible, not never the positive. It's always antibiotics. Antibiotic are cold. And it's like, well, you could use probiotics on that cut just the same. Uh, so like there is a shift happening though. These guys are telling you, these are the two top natural vets. In the I mean, the so microbiome can, thing, you know, it's revolutionized people's understanding of, of mm. you know, our relationship with bacteria. And the, the, the whole idea that, that, you know, our own digestive system is primed at birth uh, by, you know, the anal and va vaginal bacteria of the mum. And then yeah. this guy called Martin, I've forgotten his name now, he, he's the medical director at NYU. He's written a book called um, Missing Microbes. And they did a study Ma into... Martin Blaser. Martin Blaser. Yeah, brilliant book. And he basically mm. um, did a study on babies from cesarean births. And he found that because they didn't have the, the fingerprint primer of the bacteria of the mum, there were long term consequences to their health. And isn't that fascinating? Yeah. And you just know intuitively that it's right. Yeah. And so we've got, we've got to really change our relationship with our farming and our food. And we've got to overcome some of these regulatory barriers. You can understand why governments have put them in place, because obviously these heavily industrialized farming systems, particularly the livestock systems, they are a breeding ground for E. coli. And if something goes wrong, it'll get into everyone's food because they're also centralized. Mm. But we have mm. to change it. Yeah. Um... Patrick, just to take us on a, on a slightly different tack, this is fascinating stuff, but where time is short, so I want to cover as much as possible. Um, all the vegans I know are very concerned about the health of, of the planet and and or their own health. And they would they would suggest that animals might not be part of the answer to their health or the planet's health. How do you personally um, converse to those arguments? Well, I think there are a lot of young people today. I, I listen to heart radio when I put out the silage for our cows. 
because you know, my excuse is uh, <laughs> that, that the per the other person who milks the cows puts heart radio on, and I don't change it. But actually, I don't even want to change it because <laughs> I sing along, you know. And uh, there's some real bangers on it. And anyway, basically, all yeah. the food companies now they're all advertising for vegan foods. I mean, it's incredible. Sainsbury's, McDonald's. Aldi, they're all at it, advertising these vegan alternatives. And I think what they are doing is catering for a large number of young people who, in my view, understandably, but perhaps mistakenly, think that to go vegan is to, you know, address climate change and be part of the solution. And you can understand, I think a lot of those young people have a revulsion of industrial livestock farming, and rightly so. Mm. But I think their reaction in their reaction, they are failing to differentiate between the livestock, which are part of the problem, which is the intensive pigs and chickens and mega dairy herds, and the mm. livestock, which are emphatically part of the solution, including grass-fed and mainly grass-fed sheep and cattle. So I think it's really a, a symptom of amazingly Under. poor education that mm. we've got ourselves into this mess where actually all the arable farmers that have been producing plants intensively mainly grains which are mainly fed to animals which is without which you wouldn't have intensive pigs and poultry they're now mm -hmm. thinking about going regen partly because the price of fertilizer has tripled but they're looking at the market for red meat beef lamb and they're thinking well why would i do that because no young people want to eat it anymore because david attenborough says it's bad and yeah it isn't actually if you eat the right meat it's not just good is essential because it's yeah. part of the climate change solution. Because the only way that you can switch to sustainable farming if you're a farmer in England or Wales is to farm with the grain of nature and give up using chemicals. And if you mm. want to do that, then you will have to have a crop rotation or use clover mm. in your grassland or both uh, in order to rebuild the fertility which would, would be lost when you take an arable crop out. And the only way you can turn that grass of which there's about 60% more than that of the whole farmed area in the UK into food that we can eat is with ruminants, ruminants. with cattle and sheep. Mm -hmm. So if we mm -hmm. don't eat the products from those ruminants, the farmers won't be able to transition to regenerative farming. It's, it's as big as that. Mm. Yeah. So we need a massive re-education program. Of course, intensive livestock's bad, but we don't, we must understand that it's not all intensive and, if the farmers want to go regen, we have to support them by eating their products. Yeah. And is the education, is that what's behind the Harmony project uh, that you're doing with through the Sustainable Food Trust? Is that about education? And, and like, how do we sort out this education issue? Where does that start? It's, I do think we have problems. to start schools. And the Harmony project is, is a little bit sort of, it's bigger than that in a way. It's about, it's initiated by a man called Richard Dunn, who was a, a head teacher at a, a Church of England primary school in the Thames Valley. And he read Prince Charles's Harmony book, which the key message of which is nothing's separate, everything's connected. And if you want to understand your relationship with the world, just be in nature, look at nature, not just nature. Everything in the universe is connected through common mathematical and geometric laws, which are expressed in plant growth, in animals, in our stomachs, in bacteria, everything. And if we can understand the world through the prism of interconnectedness, then we will have a better relationship with it and know what to, how to make it a better place for the future. And he's convinced that unless we put this, these sort of um, streams of thinking into our children, by getting to ask good questions about sustainability, we won't have a livable planet. So I do think education is really important. And the Harmony Project is, uh, is that strand of our work. Okay, cool, yeah. You, you talk about a livable planet. By the way, if, you, if anybody wants to follow the Sustainable Food Trust, we've got a website, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. And if you go to our website, you'll mm. see lots of interesting stuff. Or if you want to see what's going on my farm, we've got an Instagram called Havod Cheese, H-A-F-O-D, Cheese. And we post quite regularly. And it's just the story of our farm. And it's, you know, I, I think it's... I, I, posted the day before yesterday a 16 second video of our cows chewing the cud after morning milking it's Lovely. so beautiful Lovely. there yeah. were 60 cows lying down in the cubicles 
all looking incredibly peaceful, Lovely. chewing the cud, and the atmosphere was amazing. I'd love that. I'd love to see them on. I can imagine that that's a new YouTube channel in its own right, isn't yeah. it? Animals chewing the cud. Slow, yeah. slow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Video. It's meditative. <laughs> yeah, I it's guess. Beautiful. Yeah, it There's is a... beautiful. Sorry, Check Nicole, it out, actually, Connor. Really Connor, go. Oh, it. Sorry, did you? Three cows, and they're all chewing in harmony. <laughs> harm, harm, harmony. In harmony. Or yeah. <laughs> Um, the, the regulation thing, just to come back to the regulation thing, isn't that a little bit about part of the problem where, like, Bren, let's say, wants to be an organic farmer, but, like, the regulation is such a pain in the put pain in the arse that it's like, like I don't want to have to go for the regulation but then I'm just not organic is there not a huge happy medium of farmers like in Ireland because they really have a problem with it in Ireland because regulation we everything you guys did so we took your large slaughterhouse idea we shut down all our slaughterhouses to the detriment of, of uh, the animals hey, I want to apologise on behalf of the United Kingdom I'd like to apologise to the Irish for <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you we'll take us we'll which take is quite a lot wrecking wrecking their farming <laughs> But the, National but, the, but, the, but our Department of Agriculture yeah, yes. is very much modeled on the British Depart Department of Agriculture. And the, but our idea of regulation is way worse than yours. It's much it's oppressive. So our farmers, yeah, good luck trying to produce organic material in in Ireland. So like, is there not a happy medium of farmers where the, the problem is they don't get rewarded enough for? It's like you hear them on the radio saying grass-fed cows are a good idea, but that there's no actual group taking that message that this guy is trying to say, which is people would say, well, you would say that because you're a, you're a farmer. But like, there's no actual group grabbing the politicians. You you mentioned some French guy in a, in a, in a blog there recently, Stéphane de Fall, and he's trying to push this 0.4%. Oh, he was the French generation. minister. French minister, was he? Okay, all right. And yeah, so the idea was that like farmers build the soil, wasn't that it? He yeah he basically at the COP twenty one in Paris when there was a big Paris climate agreement, he launched this initiative called Catch Poor Meal Four Per Thousand, and he set a target of farmers building 0.4 percent organic matter more each year in their soils, and the British government signed up to it, but of course they did absolutely nothing, mm. and you know actually he was right, and so yeah. that's what we need to do because if we if we built rebuilt the soil carbon that we stripped out of the soil during the intensive farming period we would take up to i think it's 150 parts per million it's been estimated if we did it globally of co2 out of the atmosphere and the soil is the second largest carbon bank in the world and it's the only way where we could actually sequester re-sequester carbon in a hurry but the climate change committee uk climate change committee just don't get that and i'm hoping to go and talk to them very shortly with the chair who's called Lord Deben, who I know, and basically get put them right on that. Yeah. But it's interesting, the, the whole thing, which, which you say about organic regulation, it's ironic, isn't it? If you try to do the right thing, they regulate you to bits and Absolutely. it costs a lot of money. But mm. if you're just doing normal farming where you're causing harm, you, you don't get anything like as much regulations. So we have to reverse that in a way. And we are yeah. trying to do something about that in the Sustainable Food Trust. We think all farmers should have an annual audit to measure the impact of their farming practice on emissions, biodiversity, animal welfare, everything. And it should be one audit for every farmer, not just in the UK, but globally. We're calling it the global farm metric. And we think that ideally the annual audit should be supported by governments and then it could be mm -hmm. transferred onto food labeling. So you'd be able to buy from the more regenerative farmers. That's good. And then what you would get some sort of reward. If you are sequestering lots of soil, well, then surely that's a carbon reduction. And if we were to reverse the whole, well, the carbon punishment, well, then maybe there's a carbon reward for the larger farmers that are actually sequestering soil. So there's a reward system as opposed to just mm -hmm. all stick as a bit of carrot. Um, you mentioned one thing that's interesting. You said about um, in, in Egypt, they're composting everything. And so they're taking a lot of the a biological biomass and biological waste from Cairo and using that on the fields. Now, I might mm. believe that my my bin here, my compost bin, can be used that material as opposed to being used as a as an energy regenerator. I don't know where it really goes, but that's what I'm hoping. Can that be spread on fields? Am I going to see paper cups rolling through the fields and think, "Hey, I'm growing carrots"? I think composting could save the planet, actually. And uh, interesting that COP27 is going to be hosted by Egypt. And just south of Cairo, where actually my grandfather spent the whole of his working life because he worked for the Egyptian government, there's a place called Sekhem. 
S E K E M, check it out, where they have restored thousands of acres of desert just by using compost. And it's amazing what you can compost. Obviously, you don't want to compost contaminated stuff, but anything which is, you know, reasonably organic, including, you know, uh, green waste from households, uh, park waste, straw, I mean, just anything literally which has got an organic base. It's surprising how quickly it will compost. And you can even compost wood chip. It just takes a little bit longer and a little bit more turning. And what they are doing there is they're restoring the desert. Obviously, it has to be irrigated because there's no rain out there or virtually none. So, But they find that you only need 40% of the water from the Nile in this restored compost uh, produced soils than you do in conventional agriculture. Wow. And I'm hoping that that project will feature during COP27 because I think it's really important that more people should know about that. They produce amazingly high quality food, biodynamic farmers they are, but yeah. they're, they're, they're really big influence in Egypt, which is amazing. And yeah. I think it could be the solution to desert farming, but actually compost, we've just started composting our own manures on our farm and livestock farmers tend not to do that. Although actually, do you know Ballymaloo Cookery School down in Cork? Oh, well. well, they do that there. They compost their organic manures and doing a fantastic job there, actually. Nice. Cool. But uh, one other thing I'd like to say about, I know all the dog food that people buy has to be probably quite well heat treated. But I don't know if you've heard of a man called Pottinger, mm -hmm. who was an American scientist who did some experiments on cats in the 30s. And he fed the cats raw milk pasteurized milk and sterilized milk also and um uh, meats as well but anyway the the cats that were fed the sterilized milk died and the cats that were fed on the pasteurized and raw milk survived and thrived but in the second generation there were differences in the litter size and the health of the uh, the kittens uh between the raw milk and the pasteurized milk in other words raw unprocessed food is the best food you can eat not not for everything obviously but certainly for cats and for dogs i'm sure that's true as well that that's there's a, there's a nutritional benefits of raw food which basically are lost in processing yeah. well you'll be very very pleased to hear patrick that that is exactly what we are pushing to feed cats and dogs on raw food species appropriate food high a nutrition density organ meat for their health and it pays off all these people who are, are, are watching they are veterans of having taken their cats or dogs mainly dogs onto raw food and seeing a transformation in the health of those so we're with you 100 percent of the way in thinking raw food uh, for 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 dogs and cats especially is is really is the future and real food for human beings real real species that, appropriate food for humans great yeah yes yeah. and it's interesting when you milk cows you know with us the metabolism is slower and also there are other factors not so much smoking now but drinking emotional stress other forms of abuse and they mask diet perhaps and anyway it's, it's a little bit of a slower thing. But with cows, you can literally turn our cows into a field. Each field is different. It has, you know, terroir. It has a different kind of quality of growth in the grass. Mm -hmm. And on the best of our fields, you can turn them into the field in the morning and there will be a bloom on their coats and the milk will be up 12 hours later. So this relationship between food and vitality and health mm -hmm. is very observable if you look after animals because their yeah. metabolism is quicker and also they don't have all these other nasty habits yeah yeah very much do, so do you have to move your your cattle through the field the same way uh, the kiwis do it is that the same idea that you're kind of is it like a real is there a lot of mechanization to keeping the cattle moving right you should be here for two and a half hours and then to this field or is it more you know, they're in that field one day and then the field the next you know well, we used to just graze field by field, but actually we're adopting this system called mob grazing now. Mm, and this mm. was uh, the insight of, well, various people, including a man called Alan Savory, 
who was from Zimbabwe, a white guy from Zimbabwe, and he mm -hmm. observed these herds of wild herbivores, of antelope or whatever, grazing in vast herds for safety and then defecating and urinating on the grass and therefore contaminating it, so they moved on, but in the meantime, mm -hmm. trampling it. And he realized that that was soil building. And they did that for because that was the way they'd evolved to be safe. But he, his hypothesis was that farmers should replicate this idea. And it's based on sound science, because when you defoliate a grass plant, it has a, an above and a below ground root ratio. So it has a lot of biomass in its roots and quite a lot if it's like a hay crop. Um, above ground and if you just cut the hay or the grass or your lawn or whatever if you notice it grows back very quickly the next day and that's because the plant needs to maintain this ratio and if you turn a herd of cattle into a field to leave it and leave them in the field for a week the grass keeps trying to grow back when it's eaten but it can't because it keeps getting eaten done so it sheds root mass so the theory behind regenerative Ooh. grazing is that if you allow if you defoliate either by cutting or grazing and then allow the grass to re to recover for a month mm. you will actually build soil as well as improve the yields so wow. it's, i think there's a good philosophy behind that and also i think you get more interesting varied grasses and herbs and all the rest of it cool how popular is it in in agriculture today the mob grazing it, idea because i don't see it happening anywhere around us where are you exactly uh, we are just outside Bath. Bath. Bath yeah, <laughs> yeah. oh, Bath. It's, <laughs> it's changing. Mm. There's a lot of farmers interested in it now, especially okay. dairy farmers, but because they come in anyway. But I think even beef and sheep farmers are realizing that it's if you want to be, if you want your grass to be a carbon store, that's what you need to do. Mm. Yeah, Joel Salatin is a, is a big exponent of mob grazing, and he talks about it very eloquently in his in the book. Uh, Folks, this ain't normal. Is yeah. a very good. Yeah. Way. So, if you want a little background, he's a, a great guy. We'll to share his video, Nick, that you sent me. Do you remember that yeah. video? I'll pull it up on Facebook right. after this. Just his twenty minutes explaining something. His TED talk yeah. was just oh so obvious. He's a fabulous yeah. communicator. Yeah, yeah. I've been to his need. farm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Polyface, yes, good, good, good. What about Alan Savory? Has he done a TED talk? It's Alan, I think Alan yes, Savory has done a TED, a TED talk TED as well. Talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, worth that's, we'll that. get we'll get that up so that everybody can learn about these things. I think they're so 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 important. So just in the few, last few minutes, uh, please, Patrick, um, recommended reading, recommended websites that you would suggest we could, we and and our our, our 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 people can go to 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 take this forward and help you to do what you do and help us to understand uh what would you say good books and good websites well i've mentioned a couple already um an mm -hmm. agricultural testament by sir albert howard i mean it is probably the greatest book on agriculture ever written and it oh. you know might have been written as a farmer in 1940 but it's, it's timeless really and so many you know he's got this amazing chapter critique of the national health service it's just devastating. You, know? yeah. <laughs> you think, wow, <laughs> only people could. Funnily enough, George Eustace, sometimes known as the useless Eustace, or Secretary of State, yeah. Yeah. he he yeah. actually has read the book and thinks it's a good book. It's just, I think he's just got, he's under Boris's cosh. So, you know, yeah. it's a bit bit sad, really. He's, yeah. not, he's not a leader. Yeah. Um, but um, well, other books, well, I, I mentioned a couple of websites, are our own, obviously. I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mentioned Missing Microbes, the book by Martin Blazer. Um, let's think, what else would... Well, it's Nicolette Hahn Nyman's book, Defending Beef. That's a good book. Yeah. It's just been upgraded. <laughs> Be good to yeah. uh, recommend that. Um you know my mind's gone a blank i should i should be able to rattle about 10 of them off um, what about what about gabe gabe brown you're gabe, a fan of gabe to brown? yes great book to read that's a must yeah. read book yeah and that's also yeah, there's agree. the film um which is um what the hell is it called the film with gabe brown is in uh kiss the ground kiss the ground okay. watch kiss, kiss the ground, ground movie Net great love it yeah, on netflix good. Is, that's is really this, uh, that's a great one. 
it, is it know, true? That's, uh, that, that's got that's got a lot in it. Is is it true, uh, Patrick? That um, I read a piece in uh, the Telegraph, I think it was, who they were selling the benefits of like uh, a huge portion of Britain is upland, crappy grass that they do very little with. And this guy was saying, like, we we don't have trees because we allow you allow the ruminants to run free, like we do here in Ireland. We've just got deer keeping the keeping the keeping it as waste grass essentially, uh, and keep keeping away all the big trees. So we don't have you don't have forests of any mention in this upper land, but you have got this tough grass, and there's a number of ruminants that are happy to eat that. Is there not a way that you can farm the hell out of the t- like? You know, animals like wildebeest and zebras, they live on virtual sticks sometimes. Like they have the poorest quality diet. Is there not room so we can just let loose in the upper lands that still have grass and, and, and you know, do something more useful with those empty patches of a couple of sheep per hectare? I think there are, and I think it's a very interesting point. I was up last night, actually, in the Cambrian Mountains above um, uh, an amazing area of wilderness above a uh, uh, Strata Florida Abbey, which is the Sturgeon Abbey up in Midwe- Midwest Wales. It's just complete. It's Britain's biggest wilderness south of the Highlands and Islands, much bigger than Dartmoor. And um, there's so much grass up there, and it, it's been overgrazed by sheep. And I think the trick is to reintroduce a balanced system where you have some trees and you have mixed species of cattle and sheep that are capable, the breeds that are hardy enough to cope with that sort of environment, and also versions of mob grazing. I don't think Mm -hmm. you can fence Mm -hmm. everything off, but I think we need a new kind of ecologically based farming, taking into account all the issues. And I think the point is that a hell of a lot of the United Kingdom is not suitable for arable cropping, um, mm. but you could produce ruminant grass-fed meat, of uh, sheep and cows, and you can grow vegetables through composting and maybe polytunnels. I think there's an enormous scope for that. And there's a book that hasn't yet been published, but I've just read the proof of, called Gone to Seed, which is an autobiography of a man called Simon Fairley, who I heard give a talk uh, a couple of years ago. And he said, um, I, he said, I farm 10 acres in Dorset. It's not particularly good land. You know, it's a bit hilly, a bit rough, a bit this and a bit that. But he said, there's millions and millions of acres of land like I farm in Dorset, which is similar to it. And he said, I've got an acre of veg, an acre of wheat, and eight acres of grass. And on that grass, I have a dairy cow and her male calf, beef cross maybe, and her heifer replacement. Milk the cow, make cheese, drink the milk Great. and grow the vegetable. And he's got some community. I don't know if it's a Camp Hill community or, you know, some resident community that eat all this food. And if you think about feeding Britain, there it is. You know, mm, it's yeah. the model. And, and yeah. the reason why it's called Gone to Seed, I think he was, he's called Simon Fairley. He's born the same year as me. And um, t- apparently Timothy, he was a bit of a hippie in his time. You know, was, he'd got thrown out of boarding school and all that kind of thing. And basically... Tim, Tim, Timothy Leary, who was some acid guru, was once mm. once asked what had happened mm. to all the hippies, and he said they've gone to seed. That's <laughs> the title. I love us. <laughs> Great, Patrick. You, you, sorry, were you going to wrap it up there, Nick? I, just I was. Okay, I sorry. was. Yeah, I just I want, was, to say, Pat, want to say one he's more a thing busy about man. that. Isn't it crazy that like you, we're talking about like local farming and small local farms mm. and how we need to get back to that? And yet, with Brexit, Britain is turning to bloody Australian beef, which is grown in CAFOs. Oh with Phil don't get me going and you want to bring that in <laughs> think of the carbon footprint of that crap it's mm. the stuff that you can grow 50 bloody meters from your house I mean it's yeah we need a, we need a trade deal which restricts international trade only to regeneratively grown products yeah Fabulous. And it's crazy the government did the Australian and the New Zealand trade deals it's a scandal yeah it's crazy mm. we have it as well because mm. we've got New Zealand we've Let, got New just Zealand, make wow. sure you don't get Liz trust for the next prime minister because she's <laughs> a free trader <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. No more of this. Uh, so, sorry, Nick. Patrick, yeah. can we can we feed the world using this micro farm uh, and, and and mixed farm model? 
Yeah. We'd have to eat differently and waste less food. We waste nearly 50% of the food that yes. we, you know, on the farm and off the farm. So, and we have to stop eating cheap chicken altogether. Sorry, guys, no more cheap chicken or cheap yeah. pork or mega dairies from cows that never get out to grass. More yeah. vegetables. Um, and if we, if we went regenerative nationwide, the grain production would half, half. But that's okay because half the grain is currently fed to these hapless animals in sheds so we just yeah. won't have them anymore and chicken will be yeah. expensive and a treat like it was when i was Fish, growing up sunday thing that you get yeah exactly we Quite could right. we could feed ourselves and have no less self-sufficiency than we have today in our staples if we did it that way and a lot more people employed doing meaningful work that they love and care about and they wag their tail to get up and do on monday morning i read i read stories about farms to my kid and about farm animals but we stop reading those stories at nine or ten when they start realizing that that pack of rashers is actually the pig that you sleep with at night time in the teddy so like it's it's ridiculous we know these things make us happy this is meaningful work mm. what is my what is my what is my point on the earth you know these questions we ask ourselves bloody ridiculous back in the day it was grow food protect your family get back to that sort of stuff and there's your meaning and mm. you'll love it you'll yeah love it, you know? meaningful physical work is at such a premium today and that's what farming proper farming is it's amazing mm. you yeah. feel so your thoughts come better when you're working the human body was designed to work physically and now mm. we all have to go down to the gym or something because we we don't have enough of it so yeah, yeah a lot more people would work on the land i think yeah yeah it's true yeah uh, guys uh, just before we wrap up thanks very much to everyone for listening uh thank you so much patrick nick's gonna wrap this up again but i wanted to direct people to our patreon uh, patreon page forward slash raw pet medics uh it guys if you can visit it it's great that's what keeps us going and getting uh, people in like patrick and helping us prepare for these shows it's patreon.com forward slash raw pet medics but nick you probably wanted to wrap it up so i just want to say patrick pleasure meeting you you've given me so many yeah. ideas but uh brilliant. it was just such a brilliant brilliant chat i could have done another hour of that no problem but uh i know nick you've been a huge fan for for years so it must be a well it's you actually live in it... you? sorry you live I in ireland in... i live in ireland I live in wicklow wicklow, wicklow, wicklow. Ireland. yeah Great. just below dublin yeah I, I i went to a conference in the wicklow mountains glen Cree center of peace oh, and yeah. reconciliation very nice spot yeah that's a very that's a very zen spot you're a bit of a hippie patrick i think underneath it all are you i'm more than a bit of a hippie <laughs> <laughs> that's well, a patrick, you You've been absolutely fantastic. Uh, well, we had high high expectations, and you've surpassed them all. We're so 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 delighted. We would love to get you on in a year's time just to see how the lay of the land is. Then um, your optimism and your knowledge is inspiring. I feel I feel in, uh, so much happier than I did at the beginning of the show. Thank you so much. Um, is, is there a final message you'd like to share? Wow. You can say no. <laughs> We're all connected, aren't we? You know, yeah. it's, I think each human being is, you know, we're the, we're the cells of humanity and the, 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 if the humanity is a giant organism or the food system is a giant organism, the farms are the cells and we are the cells. And if we can restore ourselves to health, physical and mental, then we can create a healthy planet together. And I think all the knowledge that we need is, is contained in our own experience and our own bodies. We don't need to look any further. Yeah, I love that. Wonderful. God. Great. Yeah. It's a great, great. place. Great place to finish. Thank you so yeah. much for yeah, sharing you. your knowledge and, and, and everything that you've learned over the years. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who's been yeah. watching today. Thank you uh, to the guys. Um, it's been a great show. I'm, I'm blown yeah. away. I'm going to do an A next week. I'm going to yeah. be thinking about this. Please guys come back and uh, ask plenty of questions. Yeah. And um, we'll share that. Um, we'll share that yeah. um, video on Facebook in case we haven't done it already, because it's just to explain to people yeah. this yeah. very simple process of we think trees are a way to sequester carbon. It takes 10, 15 Grass. years before trees any substance. Grass just grows like cilio and the cow gets the munch and she poos out all this. And she, off she goes. It's just fantastic. So, uh, exactly. so next, next week is Q&A to the people that were listening. There were so yeah. many comments in there, but we don't have time to get to them, guys. So, uh, yes. <laughs> okay. thanks, we will be answering some of those next week. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for Absolutely. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Bye. 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 Great stuff. Bye bye.